Now, most of us here tonight work in the marketing, technology, digital space. But it's interesting, talking to people in the industry, it's amazing how many people are simply too tired, too busy, or simply too cynical to really care about what brands have to say. And it seems that we're kind of ever searching for smarter technology, smarter ways of doing business. But actually, one of the things we're overlooking is the simple power of branding. So tonight, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of brands, where brands have originated from. I'm going to talk a little bit about the context of where we are now. And then I'm going to talk about some tips in terms of how we can use the power of brands today. Before I do that, I should probably introduce myself. I'm strategy director at a digital commerce agency called Blueleaf. So we work exclusively with digital, uh, with retailers and with brands who want to sell more online. But a key part of that is not only great UX, but it's also telling a brand story. So to kick things off with a kind of mini history lesson, 4,000 years ago was the origin of branding. The, the word brand actually comes from the old Norse word brander, which literally means to burn with fire. So ancient Egyptians, right through to middle-aged farmers, and even ranchers on the, the American West have used this concept of branding their, their cattle as a way when they've been sharing communal grazing ground as a way of very easily sorting out the cattle. For those ranchers who were looking after their cattle, who were feeding them well, who bred them well, it became a great way of differentiating the, their business. So even back then, branding was a useful way of differentiating products. However, the, the, kind of the first proper age of brand communication came in the 19th century. Bass Ale, is anyone here familiar with Bass Ale, the drink? Okay, just, just one man there, probably a camera fan as well. Ba Bass Ale is a, a very kind of old British brand. It's still going today, it's still sold in pubs. But what's unique about Br Bass Ale was that it was the first ever trademark brand. And this happened when, in the UK, they passed the Trade Protection Act, which allowed businesses to register their trademark. And because they had legal protection around their brands, it meant that they had a reason to, to build these brands, to spend time and money investing in these brands. Um, and in fact, what's interesting about uh, the, the Bass Ale is that it also became the very first brand that was in fact product placement. So this is a famous painting by a <coughs> guy called uh, Edouard Manet in 1882. And uh, this is the very first piece of product placement that you're seeing here. You can see the uh, Bass Ale brand um, sitting there in the corner. But also in the, uh, in the 19th century, um, we saw the kind of birth of advertising. In 1836, a French newspaper called La Presse came up with the simple idea of having paid adverta advertising within the newspaper. What this allowed people to do and allowed them to do was to reduce the price of the newspaper. So it allowed them to kind of increase the, the readership and the profitability. About four years later, a guy called Volney Palmer, who's no relative, um, came up with the idea of buying large amounts of this space and selling it to other brands. So four years within the first advert, we then had the first media planning and buying agency. Um, a guy called Thomas Barrett, who's very much known as the, uh, the father of modern advertising, was very famous for uh, running branded campaigns at the time. This was for the Pears Soap, and he came up with the idea of having targeted slogans, targeting messaging and imaging. He uh, associated the brand with high culture, high society. Uh, he even came up with the Pears Annual, which was the uh, very first piece of branded content or native advertising where essentially it was a kind of spin-off magazine. So, you know, they say there's no such thing as a, as a new idea. Well, you know, all this time ago, we even had branded content back then. Some of you are familiar with this guy. This is uh, Don Draper, famous from the, uh, the TV series Mad Men, um, and very much kind of epitomizes the 20th century, the second age of brand communication. And this was really marked by a change in technology, a change in uh, mass production of products. And what this meant was that companies, manufacturers, suddenly had huge amounts of supply, so they needed to generate demand. And this led to the invention of mass marketing and the manipulation of huge audiences using clever communication techniques. What was also interesting at the time was uh, a guy called Edward Bernay, who was the nephew of Sigmund Freud, 
came up with the idea that if you use clever psychological techniques, you could actually manipulate people's behaviour, you could create demand, um, you could change overall consumers' uh, desire for your products. And this was really a turning point um, in the journey of brand communication. And then things got more complicated. We entered the 21st century and what I call the third age of brand communication. Some of you may be familiar with this. This is the uh, marketing technology landscape. Um, and what's interesting here is that there are 1,836 vendors of marketing technology across 43 categories. And each one of those logos that you see there represents a piece of technology designed to simplify your marketing. So, you know, th that's kind of where we are. Things are so complicated that when you try and simplify them, it looks like that. And so some of you might kind of recognize some of the brands there. But uh, depending on the kind of research that you read, they say we see between 300 and 3,000 uh, logos a day. So complexity is one of the biggest challenges that businesses and individuals are facing today. How we can help businesses cope with that is key to success. And in fact, from a consumer point of view, when you're, when you're facing this much complexity, the key thing you've got in your camp is your brand. It, it, without a really strong understanding of what your brand stands for, you, don't hope, uh, you can't have a hope of having a consistent, strong message that can cut through all this complexity. But not only are we kind of in a, a complex um, marketing communications landscape, we're also in a complex uh, demographic landscape. In 2013, we entered a period of unprecedented demographic change. This was when the kind of uh, traditional marketing, uh, traditional audience of consumers born before the internet uh, stopped being a majority. And this was when digital converts, people like me who were born before the internet was around, um, but who have adopted it heavily in their lives, are now the majority. Uh, however, when we reach 2020, that's when we're going to see digital natives, those born after the internet was around, as being the majority of consumers out there. Now, what's interesting here is you're going to see enormous clashes in ideologies about technology clashes around communication, expectations of how people should communicate and should behave between these different generations. Anyone who's been to a wedding recently will have seen this in action where on one end of the table you've got Gen Y people on their phone in the middle of the meal and at the other end of the table you've got older people who are kind of looking at this as rude. From Gen Y's point of view it's perfectly acceptable. So take that further into the kind of um, marketing communication space and you, you've got a lot of complexity there. In fact, Blue Leaf as a business, we've, uh, we've just literally stopped using email for all our internal communication. We're now using a tool called Slack, um, which is essentially a digital collaboration tool. Some of you may be familiar with it, uh, which is phenomenally powerful, but it's a major shift in terms of how we communicate as a business. So, so who are these modern consumers? Um, I, I love this image. This is when, I think it was Vodafone offered uh, free Wi-Fi in certain areas of the tube, which just gives people the perfect reason never to make eye contact ever again. Um, so modern consumers are, are connected, not, not just in the sense that they're always online, but they're connected in the sense that if they have a great experience on Amazon, they expect a great experience from their local butcher's website or from their local libraries website we don't differentiate anymore this is the, the, the i suppose the issue with the internet is we just transfer a user experience from from this provider from this company onto you and your company unless you're matching up you're letting your consumers down and, I, and actually this, the same goes for b2b customers and b2c customers quite often within marketing we talk about b2b customers as a distinct set of customers Truth of the matter is, all of the, your decision makers that you're targeting within the B2B world are also consumers as well who are using all the same sites. And so what we're seeing is a kind of rising of the boats in terms of expectations of online design, online brand communication. Modern consumers expect to participate, particularly kind of Gen Y, the younger consumers, see no reason why they shouldn't be involved, allowed to collaborate, allowed to steer the creation of your products, the cr steer the development of your business. They expect to be able to leave reviews. Ultimately, they expect to be included in your brand experience. The next thing is informed. 
modern consumers now have unlimited information at the touch of the button. More to the point, people are increasingly savvy in terms of the way they find that information, they use that information. So we're looking at smart consumers who are making better choices and brands need to recognise that as well. But ultimately, we all have an expectation of innovation. Companies like Facebook, Google, Apple, where they have a constant process of iteration, have led us to have a real hunger for new things, new and novel products and offerings and services. So this puts an enormous amount of pressure on brands to stay relevant and to, to keep innovating. One of the other defining factors of the age, as we all know, probably every one of us in this room feels this on a very personal basis, is speed. Speed is one of the defining characteristics of the age. Things are moving so quickly. We've gone from marketing to real-time marketing. We've gone from data analytics to real-time data analytics. And in fact, we're moving beyond that now to predictive analytics. So knowing what's happening in real time is not enough. We've got to somehow extrapolate what's happening in the future. I mean, it's kind of exhausting just talking about it. But the, the key thing here is that as things move so quickly, you see a kind of attrition in terms of things becoming obsolete. So the key role of a business is to avoid really becoming part of that obsolete um, world. This is a, kind of a fun slide in terms of the alphabet of obsolescence. Uh, some controversial ones there. I've got some per personal favourites. Privacy, I think, is, a, is an interesting one. Uh, I also saw, saw on the uh, mobile kill horizon, as it's called, of products that are going to be killed by, by the mobile, as compact mirrors are on that because compact mirrors are no longer necessary because you simply use the camera on your phone. So there's all sorts of interesting ha things happening here. And included potentially on that uh, alphabet of obsolescence is planning or strategy. I, I saw this guy, uh, Michael Tobin, speak recently. Very interesting guy, set up TeleCity, which was a, uh, a big data warehouse, um, phenomenally successful guy. And his view is that strategy is dead, that actually it's all about moving quickly. And while he admits that the title is somewhat controversial deliberately, I think there's a, a value in what he's saying in that we're probably moving from a five-year planning cycle to a three-year planning cycle, where beyond three years, how much value is there in the business looking long term because things will have changed so much in three years time so there's also a kind of philosophy that fast reactive beats this this kind of longer term planning so we've looked at the history of brands we've looked at where brands have come from we've looked a little bit at the context of where we are now in terms of the marketplace the audiences the next section is very much about looking at kind of tips, how can we use and harness the power of brands um, when we're looking at this sort of complexity. And I think the first one is perhaps the most important one, and that is simplicity. I saw uh, Nick Robertson, who's the CEO of ASOS, speak recently, and he said that the pivotal point in his, his business history was that when they decided as a company to do nothing else other than sell fashion to 20-somethings, they, they, they simply wouldn't do anything else. And once they realized that, then the business as a whole could align behind that single-minded focus. So it was enormously powerful. Now, after his speech, I was chatting to a couple of the guys from ASOS, um, and they were, they were 31 and 32, and they were telling me that the nickname in their office is Uncle because they are the oldest people in the, in the entire business. Literally everyone in ASOS is in their 20s. And in fact, for the ASOS Christmas staff party, they hire out a whole nightclub. And he said, basically, it looks like a normal nightclub, full of 20-year-olds who are pretty drunk, quite trendily dressed, having a good time. So, you know, it's, it runs right the way through that organization. Compare that with Tesco, who's trying to be all things to all people. It's caught in the middle ground. At the top, it's being eroded by the likes of Waitrose. At the bottom, it's being eroded by the likes of Lidl and Aldi, brands who really know their audience, who have a very niche and specific focus. Um, and Tesco's is really struggling as a result. And in fact, Blue Leaf as a business, we, 15 years ago, we were a marketing services agency. And then about five years ago, we realized that we needed to, to go more niche and we became a digital agency. And since that time, we've been continually evolving the business and we're now a digital commerce agency only working with retailers and brands who want to sell online. If we're speaking in 
18 months time we'll probably have narrowed our focus and we're already kind of investigating niches within digital commerce and e-commerce um, so I think that the key message here is, is know your focus because once you know it the people that you're talking to will recognize that you'll be talking the same language as them um, and that there are just there's just so much competition you can't hope to be an expert across a wide area anymore things are moving too quickly so narrow your focus a kind of second element to uh, simplicity is simplicity around the message. Because of this kind of byproduct of speed, we're, we're living in the age of impatience. None of us have got any time. Quite frankly, you know, th there's interesting statistics around the impact of, of page load speed. So if you, your page hasn't loaded within 40 seconds, 25 people have abandoned that page. We are very impatient people these days, with good reason. Um, and so from a brand communication point of view, you need to be working really, really hard to do all the thinking for your audience. If you're going to make them work at your brand, they haven't got the patience. So you need to be utterly rigorous in, in the way you're talking to them. One of the ways that you can do this, um, we, we're kind of seeing this movement towards uh, explosive growth around image sites such as Twitter um, or Instagram and, and Pinterest, where people used to read articles, then they read blogs, then they read tweets, and now they just look at Pinterest and, and Instagram. You know, we, we're kind of, we don't, we don't have time. And so coming up with a strong visual language is really important. In fact, Jonathan Klein Getty, the founder of Getty Images, um, has said that the fastest growing language on earth is imagery, which is a really important point. And in fact, as a business, Getty Images has grown phenomenally off the back of serving, serving people great images that tell a story very quickly. But also your brand these days is your user experience. Um, th this particular product here, some of you may know, is the OXO soft gripped potato peeler. Now OXO looked at the potato peeler and another, other similar products as a range and these from a design perspective had plateaued for many years. And they looked at this and they said from a usability point of view how can we create a brand? So they looked at the ergonomics, they looked at the tactility of the product um, and they came up with soft gripped which was perfect for people with uh, arthritis, disabilities and just better to use for people as a whole. This same philosophy is now going online. F for example, Amazon. Can I see a quick show of hands? Who here buys off Amazon? Pretty much everyone. Now, keep your hands up if you are a fan of Amazon and what they stand for. Okay, that is a massively smaller amount of people than people who buy off Amazon. And what that, the point that makes is that we are loyal to user experiences increasingly. Not just brands, we're loyal to user experiences. So the smart brands will get people who buy into them as a brand, but they'll also make sure that people are loyal to their specific user experience. And we're seeing companies take this philosophy offline as well. Things like Apple Pay, where you can buy uh, instantly with a thumbprint, creating these path of least resistance to the part of the business people want to move to. Um, as humans, there's a law, law of physics, which I think is the, the law of least energy. Um, organisms and objects are, are hardwired and intrinsically move towards the path of least resistance and it kind of circles back into that whole trend around speed and impatience you, you've got to deliver this stuff to your audience so quite frankly if you don't stand for anything you're f if you don't stand for something you'll fall for anything for a lot of us we just don't care about what a brand has to say. Unless I'm looking for that product at that particular time, why should I care about your very slick promotional messaging that you've spent many, many millions of pounds for? Increasingly in today's market, especially Generation Y, they expect people to do well by being good. So you need to, as a brand, stand for something, not just something about you, something about the broader world, something about your audience, um, what that is needs to come from somewhere authentic, whether that's from the visionary leader or whether that's from the, the shop floor. As a brand, you have to stand for something. Interestingly, we're seeing a real backlash against 
uh, experience. So traditionally, if you're a big institution and you're a bank with hundreds of years of heritage, you would outcompete a newcomer any time. But people have lost faith in institutions. People have lost faith in um, politicians, in banks, in organisations, and s particularly for Generation Y, who are perhaps those who feel more keenly some of the bad decisions that these organisations and institutions have made, they're more likely to buy into an independent blogger than they are a multinational brand that's been around 50, 100 years. So, you know, unless you bring this kind of authenticity of voice, um, unless you, you have principles, uh, then quite frankly, um, you're in trouble. Now, this leads into the next point around uh, your brand being your content strategy. What I mean by this is the two are intrinsically linked. You need to look at your brand platform, your brand values, what the proposition of the brand is, and unpack every single piece of that. And every item should represent a thread that you can weave together as a stronger, more cohesive whole. Because ultimately, uh, a great content strategy does one thing, it helps people in their daily life. It doesn't talk about the brand, it doesn't talk about the product, it talks about the issues that that particular brand solves for people in their daily lives. So one of the things you can do with your content strategy is map the problems that people face in their lives. And then it becomes a kind of question of, of presenting that with the right tone of voice, the right personality, the right style and rhythm of, uh, of copy, even down to the vocabulary, controlling each part of that. Um, again, you know, this doesn't need to come from the marketing department. Often the most authentic, author most authentic content comes from other areas in the organisation. If you're really smart, you'll be like ASOS and you'll get your customers to create your content for you. ASOS will do all sorts of uh, interesting things, some of them we'll, we'll talk about in a bit, but they have lookbooks which allow their customers to upload uh, content and looks that they think are particularly interesting. So that's coming from that audience of 20-somethings who, who uh, know the brand. This is kind of an interesting one. This is the idea of your brand as an operating system. In the same way that we use our laptops, our PCs, our Macs, and we, we create things on the operating system, this is about opening your brand to be an operating system in its own right. Now, this was something that was done for the Obama campaign in 2008, where they created a very iconic brand identity around the campaign, and then they basically opened it up and gave it to the volunteers, to the campaigners, and they kind of said, look, subvert it, take it where you want. So you had farmers in Iowa who, was who were using this kind of imagery in their own way. You had Jewish uh, activist groups in New York who were doing the same thing. Now, it's quite risky because it could easily be hijacked, but what it allowed their campaigners and their supporters to do was to, to pick this up and run with it and create a grassroots movement that had far more of a momentum than perhaps the, the risk. So if you can be brave enough, open your brand up, give people the tools to do it. A really interesting brand that has been phenomenally successful in this is Lego. It turns out, you know, Lego, the ultimate modular product, well actually Lego is the ultimate modular brand. If you look online, there is an unbelievable amount of content from Lego that's been created by fans who have done stop frame photography or created their own um, uh, Lego creations and objects. Uh, and Lego have just opened it right up to the community um, and created thousands of hours of video, thousands of images that Lego as a brand couldn't possibly hope to, to spend enough money on to create. So it's really interesting. And taking it a bit further, um, ASOS have, uh, have created, the, some of you may be familiar with the ASOS marketplace. Now on paper, what ASOS have done here is they, they've opened up their business to let boutique retailers, um, people who sell kind of uh, independent labels, and they've, they've given them a, a, a commercial platform. So on paper, ASOS have kind of said to their competitors, come on in. But it's really smart because they're, they're not competitors in, in reality. They're never going to compete with ASOS. But what they're doing is they're bringing kind of an edginess um, and, a, a, you know, this kind of fast fashion element that ASOS, however fast they move, they can't bring this level of cool. It shows them as an edgy, cool brand that isn't afraid to, to involve these people. And once you get these people into your brand universe, then they ultimately become really strong brand ambassadors. 
And, you know, they've kind of taken the idea of putting, giving people the chance to become part of the brand experience, not just buying the brand, but being part of the brand experience. This is uh, ASOS as seen on me. So ASOS is a brand some of you may know actually stands for as seen, uh, ASOS, as seen on screen. That's it. I had to think a moment there. So they've done as seen on me um, where people can often, if you go to this, it seems it's mainly kind of, uh, aspiring 20-year-old models who are kind of wanting to get images of out, out there of themselves wearing ASOS clothes. Now this is a kind of heartbreaking image. I don't know if any of you have seen this on, on social media. This is um, a Syrian girl who was in one of the uh, refugee camps. Now when a, a journalist pointed a telephoto lens at her, her immediate reaction was to put her hands up. She thought it was a gun. She wasn't old enough to understand. Now, this has done amazingly well on social media in terms of trending because what it does is it touches an emotional note in our hearts. These days, we, we kind of are, are increasingly immune to, to brand communication because we're exposed and desensitized to an enormous amount of imagery. So brands, uh, some brands, if you do it well and not do it cynically, if you can use and harness the power of emotion, you, you almost need to, to move the needle in terms of brand communication, you almost need to use that. However, whatever you do, don't do it cynically. If I was to kind of stick a Dove logo anywhere near here, it, it would be a pretty shocking thing to do. But the point I'm making here is that we are quite desensitized to information and communication. And brands, if you get a cut through around emotion, you can really get audiences to, to take notice of your brand. But we've also moved, with the transparency of the internet, we've kind of moved from tone of voice to tone of action. This idea that my tone of voice, how I talk about my brand, how I position myself is enough, is, is, is pretty redundant. Brands need to be seen to, to be behaving in the right way. And this is a, a fantastic uh, piece of brand communication by IKEA. They teamed up with the uh, United Nations High Commission for, for Refugees and they created a, a shelter. Now, if up to now, if you go to a refugee camp, you're looking at staying in a, a very flimsy tent and it will last six months and it's highly insanitary. It's not particularly a fantastic place to be. So IKEA took it upon themselves as a problem that they could solve based on who they were as a company. And they came up with this shelter and it's been optimized for shipping volume, optimized for, for weight, price, safety, every aspect of this has really kind of democratized the design process to solve this issue. This is phenomenally powerful because when I see this from, from IKEA, uh, you know, as a company, I, I, I think that they're, they're doing good. They're, they don't need to tell me they're doing good. I, I can get all of that. So it's this kind of idea of um, tone of action instead of tone of voice. Red Bull is a really good example um, around their F1 team. For a lot of brands out there, if they want to sponsor an F1 team, they'll kind of stick a logo on the, the, the driver's helmet and maybe on the car for F1 when they wanted to get involved, for, for Red Bull when they wanted to get involved in F1. And they decided to spend £250 million a year on having a team and winning. So that is kind of deep branding. That is tone of action. It epitomizes tone of action. But even uh, large, large companies like uh, Unilever, Unilever have launched the Sustainable Living Programme, which is costing them money. You know, it's kind of affecting the share price of the business. The, you know, the city's going, is this actually a good thing? Are we going to see a return on investment? But what they're saying, all of their brands will be sustainable and will be um, sourced in a sustainable way so that anyone who works with Unilever has to source their products from a sustainable place and has to follow their corporate social responsibility. That, you know, I buy into that on a personal level and it is that kind of action and behavior that uh, the people know about and get to see and if brands are pretending they're one thing and being another um, it's quickly exposed so yeah j just a final word on the the IKEA thing I mean what, what's great here is it, it does a number of things it, it shows they stand for something um, it shows that you know they're kind of touching people from an emotional point of view they're, they're changing people's lives um, that's powerful in itself and finally, you know, it kind of delivers on the fact that they know how to make things flat pack. 
So it's, it's got it all as a piece of brand communication as far as I'm concerned. But uh, IKEA have also uh, been doing some other interesting things. This is an advert for um, the, uh, IKEA in Airbnb. So this was kind of a marketing exercise where families could win the chance to stay overnight in an IKEA. Now IKEA is a pretty random world, but amazingly there are a lot of people who want to stay overnight in an IKEA. Um, so they put the advert on Airbnb and uh, you, you've got to choose your experience. So the, the next image is, uh, is basically um, a fantastic image. I, I just love the look on that kid's face. It's just, this is incredibly weird. Um, but, but ultimately, you, you could choose to be woken up by puppies or by an orchestra or by all sorts of things. Um, now, what I like about this is that it's two brands collaborating. On paper, why? But actually, because they both represent brands that are innovative in, in their use of space. So increasingly, we're going to see brands collaborate. Um, this isn't an advert for, for t-shirts and beards and uh, sunglasses, believe it or not. It's actually a, a joint venture between Spotify and Uber, two very, very disruptive brands. Uh, as we move to this kind of single-minded focus in terms of our, our brands, it, it opens up opportunities for collaboration where we're not going to tread on each other's toes. And in fact, you know, to deliver an overall experience, we kind of need to work with other brands and other organizations. So they came up with the idea of having Spotify in the back of Uber cabs. From Spotify's point of view, this was great because it turned the back of a cab into a piece of real estate for their product. From Uber's point of view, this was great because when I sat in an Uber cab versus any of their competitors, I had a very visceral uh, experience. I got to play the, the soundtrack to my life as I cruised around the, the city. So these are two very disruptive brands working closely together and seeing the world with a different filter. Someone somewhere in, in one of these companies looked at the back seat of a cab, and I'm sure they're going to do an awful lot more Uber here, and said, this isn't the back seat of a cab, this is a, a shop window. You know, this is a showroom for any digital product that we want to do. So I think um, that level of disruption and looking at the world with a new filter is a key thing for brand communication. Now, this one may, may seem a bit abstract at first, but it's the idea that your brand is your data. We, I think this is probably a pivotal moment in the kind of development of, of brand communication, this point where Many of us are involved in multivariate testing or A-B testing this idea that we can launch a website and we can test route A with you know, big image, small call to action, route B with a small image and big call to action. What's interesting here though is we can start to test the core brand proposition. Now what that means is we can actually create a kind of Darwinian approach to branding where we can launch a brand, we can test it, we can refine it over time, and we can improve it. And this is enormously powerful. And we can do that to different segments of our audiences, different regional areas. So from a brand, from a data point of view, you, in the same way you did with your content, you unpack your brand, you look at the values, you look at the proposition, you need to do the same thing with data and start tagging and tracking each of those brand levers so that you can start to track and test the evolution of your brand. Um, I think you know, data architecture needs to, to almost um, represent brand architecture. And you know, where this is happening in action is uh, for Facebook dark posts. Is anyone here familiar with Facebook dark posts? Okay, great. I mean, this is phenomenally powerful. What Facebook have done, have, have they opened up the back end of Facebook to advertisers. So they're essentially giving you free reign to access and segment their data. Um, what, so interestingly enough, um, a US company called BarkBox, which does a subscription service around um, pet treats. So if I'm a pet owner, I can subscribe to BarkBox and I'll get a, a monthly box with kind of rubber ball and some treats, uh, which Tell, tell the dog I love it. Uh, what, why they have done so well is because they looked at Facebook's data and they said, okay, I want all the dog owners, but I want dog owners who own a retriever. I want dog owners who own a boxer, who own a whatever other type of dog you care to mention. They then essentially started advertising to each of those different segments 
And for each advert that they sent out to someone who owned a retriever, the ad had a retriever in it. Same for the boxers, same for the German shepherds. Quite simple, but, but what that's moving, if you start testing and, and refining your, your brand, your core brand message, for tools like this Facebook dark posts allow you to, to serve at that refined message to an increasingly small segment, ideally a segment of one. So I think this is, uh, this is phenomenally powerful. Another example of this level of um, personalization is um, Very, which is owned by Shop Direct. Shop Direct own a few uh, big high street brands. Um, they've, they've invested a huge amount of money in personalizing their homepage. Uh, they expect the impact of this to add 20 million pounds in this financial year. So what it means is that if I'm a 20-something and I'm looking for a party frock, I can come to Very and it'll automatically serve me all my favorite fashion brands on the homepage, along with highly targeted offers that are aimed only at me. But if I'm a kind of stay-at-home uh, mum or dad um, who's into homeware, it'll give me that that same information. Um, so, so they've done a little bit of this where they, they started personalizing the top level navigation. Um, just from that alone, that added five million pounds worth of revenue, incremental revenue. And so um, this is, they can serve 1.2 million instances of their homepage right now. By the end of the year, they reckon they'll be able to serve three million instances of their homepage. Um, and in fact, you know, the, the point here, uh, Shop Direct Group Chief Executive uh, Alex Baldock said, uh, we know relevance wins in retail and right now customers are drowning in a sea of irrelevant choices. So how do you compete? If you're a competitor and you've just got the same homepage and it's just there month in, month out, how do you compete with brands that are uh, doing this? And this is, you know, this is just about the kind of the, the offers and the products. But what if the, the core brand message evolved in the same way? And I think that's something we're going to start seeing happening. I was at, uh, was any, anyone at the uh, Web Summit in uh, Northern Ireland, in Ireland last year? Um, it was a three-day event all about, uh, all about digital, the digital industry. Uh, ironically, they didn't have any Wi-Fi. It's kind of one of those, which was um, pretty shocking. But there was a guy called Chris Satchel, who was the CTO at Nike. Um, and he was making the point that, really, your, your brand is your technology. So they are hard coding their brand into, into their technology. Literally, you know, you can see it there in their code. Um, some of the, the principles they were the kind of instilling in their technology are authenticity, consistency, safety, because it's so easy to kind of do technology over here and think, well, I'm a developer, what's that got to do? with my brand, but, but, but the two are, are intrinsically linked. Um, if you look at Nike as a business, it's kind of gone from a, an apparel or a, you know, sportswear company to a technology company. I'm wearing a piece of Nike technology on my wrist now, and um, you, you know, it, you've got to make the link between uh, your brand and, and technology. So starting to, to kind of wrap things up, um, the key thing I would say is go back to your, your organizations and your, your companies and, and liberate your brand. For many years, we've been talking about how data wants to be free, you know, the open data movement. Actually, brands want to be free. Um, don't have brands locked up in ivory towers. Everyone from a cleaner to the CEO needs to feel ownership of the brand because in the same way that Nick Robertson at, C, at uh, ASOS has, has got everyone in the business, completely on brand, to, to have the whole organization move to that, be consistent inside the organization and out. Um, literally everyone needs to, to know what the brand stands for. So go back, be an evangelist, tell everyone in your organization. Um, you either want to know about the brand or they need to start talking about the brand. So this is kind of so summing things up. I think you know if, if we look at all the different elements that, that we've got here, all of these are critical. But ultimately, for me, you can boil it down to what I call the transaction within brand communication. This simple transaction, which basically this great quote by a guy called Henry David Thoreau, who's a philosopher, he said, the price of anything is the amount of life you exchange for it. So in other words, you know, if me as a consumer, you as a brand, if you expect me to give you any of my hard earned time and attention, of which I have very little, you better give me something of value, whether that's kind of 
moving the, the brain chemicals around in my brain to make me feel a little bit happier or sad in a nice way or tell me something I didn't know or help me in some way. That's kind of where we are with modern uh, brain communication. So that's, that's it. I'm very happy to answer any questions. Thank you.